I have entered into four or five field sites kind of from scratch that I found the access to. And they're all completely different. <laughs> um, some of them I stumbled into through friends of friends in the sense that, uh, you know, you knew someone who worked there or you had a, a friend's spouse that, that was an in. Um, and you can kind of you know, talk that person up and say, I'm doing this study. And, and depending on their role in the company, you know, they can, they don't have to be the high up, highest up person, but as long as they're willing to kind of champion your work and say, oh, this cool person wants to come talk to us, it can be at least um, a personal connection to someone in power. Once, this is a funny one, once my, this was my actual, my dissertation research, my advisor was interviewed on NPR and a company called her. <laughs> and said this was when I was studying or interested in studying the um, use and introduction of blackberries and she had been talking about my work on NPR and the company said well, we're just about to do this you come tell us what to do and she said no um, we're not very good at that but would you be interested in us studying your process and and that was the in for, um, for my dissertation research and um, but other than that, I would say that in some way or another, I realize in retrospect that there's always a personal connection. Currently, I'm studying the OC courts um, and looking at the introduction of electronic legal files. And my husband's an alternate defender. He's a basically a public defender in, in the court. So he's not actually at all connected to the area of the course that we're studying. We're studying the administration process. But it was through his boss, who then talked to a judge, who then talked to the COO of the courts, right? So you kind of you get it in these strange ways. Um, but there's always been some personal connection way. I think that a lot of ethnography is kind of finding those personal connections and leveraging them. That can get tricky, of course, when then you want to go in as a researcher and, and you want to make sure that you're balancing how much do you feel like you owe people in the site and what do you think you owe them and what do they think you owe them and why are you there. And one thing I would say also to students at Stanford is that there's these particular institutions like Stanford that carry a lot of weight in the world, and that's great. <laughs> I think that you can use that to kind of be someone of authority and be someone that oftentimes companies want someone from Stanford to study us because it makes us feel kind of important to know that Stanford cares, Whatever, even if it's a really, from your perspective, you're just trying to do your work. But for their perspective, that's an affiliation that actually matters and that they can be proud of. So that can help you get in the front door. I really felt that way when I was at MIT. I used to get trotted out as the MIT person who's here to study us. Um, but it can be tricky because there's a legacy that comes with that and there's a lot of reputational baggage that you're going to carry with you into the field that you're going to have to make sense of. So what do they think of the Stanford person? Why do they want the Stanford person there? And I think being aware that you're more than just an individual, but you're carrying kind of the legacy of an institution behind you as an ethnographer, something to be aware of when you're in the field, because it can affect the trust dynamics and their assumptions that you may or may not have a hidden agenda. Things to be incredibly aware of are that people don't like the idea of being studied. But once you're there, it's a totally different thing. So you tend to really, really undersell what you're there for and why you're there when you're first negotiating access. Um, people in businesses, if this is a business that you're going to try and get access to, are busy. So the number one thing that managers tend to care about is that you're not going to distract people and take time away from, and you're going to be sensitive to both the information that you may see and the dynamics of meetings and the fact that everyone's just busy. The last thing they want is someone to go in and disrupt everything. So I'm incredibly sensitive to that going in and do a lot of assurances about, you know, you can always tell me to go away, the kind of work I'm doing, you know, not just about basics like privacy, but much more substantially about, you know, how am I going to have the nuanced understanding of when people do or don't want me around. Now, once you're there, it's a different story because then they get to know you as a person and they're like, oh, come into my office. Let me talk to you for 50 minutes or, you know, and that's fine. But don't ever tell anyone that that's what you're expecting going in, that those relationships have to emerge. There is a whole there's a whole question of privacy agreements, which I think there are standard ones in the community and you can ask around friends. But generally, our privacy agreements are we're not here to look at your stuff of what you're doing or tell your kind of industry secrets. And, but yet we need the right to publish. So, so anyone who wants to review what you're going to say is not going to work, but many of the lawyers, every lawyer 
I never worked with his tenant to understand that. I even studied the internal legal team of a company. I studied in-house counsel, and they were, like, fine. So lawyers tend to get it. Um, in terms of trust, yeah, <laughs> that's the whole game. Um, and that's part of what I mean when I talk about understanding the institutional legacy that you bring in. That's just one facet of all of the things you have to be aware of when you're figuring out how to navigate trust. If people don't trust you, you're, you can't do your job. Like, that's the fundamental. Like, you just can't be an ethnographer if you don't build some trust with enough people. Um, you're not going to ever see anything kind of real enough or nuanced enough to be able to, to have an interesting finding. So to me, trust is central. Um, trust is interesting because I do think it's a relationship between humans. You're human, they're humans. Trust doesn't come in a vacuum. Um, and so there's a degree to which how much you're going to share about yourself because that's how people in the real world come to trust each other is they actually share personal information about themselves. So if you're going to go in and think of yourself as an objective scientist who is a fly on the wall, it's going to be really hard to build trust in an interpersonal way. But, you know, this also isn't about you. So, so it's really, it's, a, it's finding that balance of going in and, and being a human and maybe talking about your life and maybe talking about your personal, you know, if, if that's the environment that you're in, you have to kind of figure out the environment. But to find a way to connect with them as humans is absolutely necessary. Um, sometimes it feels a lot like playing dress up, <laughs> but playing dress up in the most genuine way you possibly can. Um, so I do tend to try and dress like the people I study. You've probably heard that already. But it's more than just dress. I'll swear if people swear. I won't swear if people don't swear. Um, I was telling a friend about this interview, and she said, well, you have to tell them about the time that you did shots with a chef in a big hotel. Like, I did. You know, it's the middle of the day, and the, the chef's asked if you want to do a shot of tequila. You do it. <laughs> I mean, maybe you have reasons not to, which are fine. But at that moment, I realized that doing that shot of tequila actually was two because one shot would show that I was just, like, half asking it you know I had to really show them that I was committed to hanging out in the kitchen um but so so those are the kind of things that you just have to go with it sometimes if you know and if you're severely uncomfortable that's something you have to figure out and maybe that isn't the right environment for you which is fine but being able to kind of stretch those boundaries in yourself and go with the flow and figure out what do you need to do to show these people that you're there as their friend um not entirely their friend because they do know you're researching them. So I also do a lot of kind of managing that expectation of what, why do you, you know, people don't know why you're there. It's very disconcerting when they don't know what you're looking at. So oftentimes I will tell people like, oh, that's the kind of thing I think is interesting. And it, I try and make it the most innocuous thing ever, right? But just to give them an idea, oh, that's the kind of thing she's interested in. And then I can kind of see all the interesting stuff at the margins um, and if, you know, hopefully they're not going to only show me that kind of thing, but just cause you know that people have a running question in their head about why is she here? Like, what does she want to see? Like, I'm not interesting. Why in the world, you know, most people just, there, there's this anxiety of why would you want to watch me? And so to say like, oh, well I'm studying technology use and the fact that it just took you five times to, you know, five tries to open your inbox and, you know, that's interesting to me. They're like, oh, okay, well. That's kind of lame, but okay. Then they have some explanation of why you might be there. And it doesn't matter whether or not you care about, you know, how long it took them to open their inbox. But they've got some storyline that helps them justify your presence. And then all kinds of things happen. So that's one thing I've definitely used. Um, another thing you do is you, that people will test you always. You can tell them that it's confidential. You can tell them over and over again. But they're going to be kind of curious what someone so is doing down the hall. And whether or not it's explicit, they're trying to figure out whether or not you're going to tell their secrets by asking you about others. And so maintain that, you know, that real clear line of like, I can't do that or I can't tell you that. You know, I wouldn't be doing my job if I told you that. Um, and I do say oftentimes, like, for me to do what I do well, like, the only person I will destroy if I break confidentiality is myself. Um, you know, that for me to do my job, I have to maintain, I have to take this incredibly seriously. Those are the things that, that I think it's important to talk about explicitly when they come up and to try and put yourself in the shoes of the people you're studying, which I think it makes sense if you think about it from their perspective, 
of why in the world is this person here and why do they think I'm interesting? Um, and we tend to think, well, of course you're interesting because we're studying you. But the idea that you may not be, um, that that may not be apparent to them is really important. And the last question is, how do I design my field work? That's a really good question. Um, as a student of John Van Manen, I was fully like drilled into me that every place is interesting. And if you can't find something interesting there, this may not be the kind of uh, research that's for you. And I actually completely agree with John. Like I, I find, I find everyone interesting. I find every organizational context interesting. I don't have any problem believing that I'm going to find something interesting in the place. So um, that's one extreme. And I do think that there are times where you go and be like, I don't know what's interesting here. And I'm just going to like talk to people and, and smell it out. However, there is, there is that storyline of why are you there? So I tend to have a storyline to tell people what I'm studying. You have to have something that you're telling usually the management of the company. Um, for me, technology has been a nice one because it's neutral. So if I say I'm studying technology and use, everyone's like, oh, okay, cool. You know, if I said I'm going to study power dynamics, do you think that would go over real well? No. <laughs> but so finding something that you are interested in that kind of generates much more kind of insight, but it's something that they can understand. So I usually go in with a storyline of what I'm studying. And it's not that I'm not studying technology, but to me, that's just a window into a lot of other things. So, but that's different. So that's the storyline, which I think is important. Um, and then in terms of the balance between inductive findings and some sort of focus direction and research design. I tend to not officially, I mean, not in some kind of explicit design way, but I, I realize that for every study I've done, there tends to be a breaking point somewhere in the middle where you take stock and think what's interesting here. So I do a whole period of just talking to as many people as I can and kind of asking as open-ended questions, tell me about your day, tell, you know, whatever the, the questions are that seem to generate, in, you know, what, what is whatever I think is interesting. And kind of doing the whole, like, oh, if you ask me down in the kitchen, I'm going to go. You know, so just kind of following whatever, wherever it leads me. And then at some point, brainstorming either with friends or with writing a bunch of memos to myself and figuring out, like, what do I think is interesting here? Um, and that can be, you know, three, four, five, six months into it even. So a while of that real open-ended part. But then thinking, okay, you know what? I think that what's unique about this place is X, and so I really should go back and think about X more critically. So at some point I do that, but I, it, it's a little bit of a gut feeling about when to do that. And even when I'm back looking more directly at X, you try and uh, cast a wide net of what might be interesting. So I'm much more on the inductive side of things. I can tell you that the first day at every research site is incredibly and horribly awkward. <laughs> Um, and you never dress right because you just don't know yet. I, I don't think I've ever dressed right the very first, and they'd let you know, like I've been teased. Um, and you don't know, I mean, you're walking into a minefield of organizational dynamics. That's power structures, that's norms, that's fears, that's organizational change. Like you don't, you have no idea about the minefield that you're walking into. And that first day is only enough to make you realize that, okay, there's a lot going on here, usually. Um, and it's just what it is. So you walk in, you are as friendly and bland and engaged as possible. So you try and just think of yourself as a sponge with a big smile and, you know, try your best to kind of address and think through any fears my people might be having and, um, be innocuous, but also project a degree of excitement that you're able to be there. Um, the relationships develop slowly. They don't develop with everyone. Um, we all have kind of informants that we end up clicking with, and that's okay, as long as, especially if you're aware of the fact that, like, hmm, it's funny that only the people in sales ended up talking to me and not these other people. Is there a reason for that? Is there a structural reason why this one occupational group or this one division ended up being far more open? And if so, you end up writing about that division, but hopefully you have enough presence of mind to put it in context of what's going on around them so it's not like these people are nice and these people aren't nice. It's never anything that, that simple. So it's okay to kind of, in my mind, to pursue those that are open to you as long as you have the presence of mind to understand why that may or may not be and part, make that part of your structural argument. The one thing about relationships is if you are in some legitimate way ever able to get people outside of the office, that's lovely. 
you know. Um, I oftentimes ask to interview spouses, which makes sense given the kind of work I do, but also it means I get out, I get in their homes, even just to like come over and have coffee and talk to your spouse. Um, not always their home, sometimes it's out to tea, coffee or whatever, but anyway, it's outside of the office. And so if you can do that in a way that's non-threatening, I think you see a whole different side of people and they become far more open about the workplace because when they're actually in the office, they're in a particular mode. I've also been able to go on retreats with several companies, and that's really fun because <laughs> you do see another mode, of, uh, mode there. Um, and as you could probably tell from my story before, I'm happy to, you know, engage in whatever extracurricular, not, I guess not whatever extracurricular activities they do, but like I've, I've gone out drinking many a time because that tends to be where, you know, people uh, get to know their colleagues. Uh, in terms of field notes, that's really tricky. I had a once I had a wonderful grand idea that you could use iPads to collect field notes. I've never seen it work. It's just far too alienating. I wouldn't even try it. Um, I record as much as I can within IRB and people's comfort level. They tend to forget the recording if they trust you. And then I am as sly and quick in my written notebook as 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 much as possible. So I'll do a timestamp and say, this is happening or this is happening. Um, one of the nice things if you're actually in a company is to find uh, find a way to get a cubby or some working space that you actually still have visibility of what's going on. And that's a great way to get people to forget you're there. And then you can actually sit there and type up your field notes from an interview from that morning uh, or just actually sit there and observe what's going on and type field notes in the moment. So I always recommend if you're able to find a little cubby to work in that, 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 that you can actually just sit there and type notes. That's always lovely. It's tricky, though, and it, and it requires, you know, going back to those notes right away, especially if you're doing the kind of jotting of the scribbles. Um, I have found that one thing that I ended up being really useful for me, not ideal, but is if you're commuting to your field site to actually dictate your thoughts on the way home. And they're not as structurally organized as if you type up your field notes, but the benefit of not losing your initial impressions is really high. Now, if you happen to be rich and have resources and have, then I get those field notes professionally transcribed, and it's lovely. But so that's been one of the things I've had to learn to do later in my career when I just have I'm doing too many things and I'm not just you know in the field in my dissertation research or something like that. So that's been kind of a lifesaver. In terms of leaving the field, it's never time to leave the field. I mean, every time I've ever left the field, it's because of external circumstances. I will tell you that my dissertation research, I was pregnant during my dissertation research. And it, it was interesting because as I got bigger and bigger, all of the senior brass at the company but were like, oh, yeah, I guess we should talk to you. It looks like you're not going to have much time. And, and I had... I think it was like five interviews scheduled with a CEO and several other top, top people. And then I got put on bed rest and I couldn't do any of those interviews. And I was devastated. Um, and I thought I couldn't write a dissertation. And of course I did. So part of the moral of the story is that you can always talk to one more person. You can always keep going. But there is some level where you just have to have faith that there's going to be a story in your data. And you're going to be okay. And you're going to have more than enough and that you just have to cut it off. And I think that's one of the most incredibly difficult, both because you have relationships with those people by now and you don't want to leave necessarily, and because it's really scary to leave because now you have to make sense of everything. Um, and because there's just, if you're a good ethnographer, you just, you're, you want to see more. So leaving is really hard and you have to force yourself to do it, or the doctor does by putting you on bed rest, or your advisor does because you're done already. Or the realities of just, you know, we have to move on. So it's, ne it's never a good time to leave the field. I have tried to strategically come back. You know, some, some, especially if you're watching a change in progress, you can do some kind of like design in some follow-up visits, which I think helps with your peace of mind. Oh, no, I'm going to miss everything. Um, and can be a nice design, research design. But that depends on kind of the phenomena of what you're studying. In terms of negotiating the process with my participants, um, that's also completely unique to, to the place. What do they understand? So, so people let you in, they often then forget about you. 
So as long as you can get yourself in the front door, I've never had like managers breathing down my back in the sense of like, when are you going to give us your, your findings? I tend to try and manage those top relationships by actually reaching out to them every so often and being like, hey, it's been six months. I'm still here. If you want to hear from me, let me know. <laughs> or can I give you a progress report or something just so you don't wake up one day and they're like, oh, oops, we didn't want you here anymore. You know, just to kind of keep those lines of communication open. And I tend to either meet with them and just kind of chat through what I've been up to and keep it a little bit vague, but also, you know, so they feel like they're part of the process. Or I'll give them some bullet points of like, this is what I've been doing. This is the concept I'm looking at. Um, and again, keeping it so that they might think it's enough that they're interested, but not enough that they really have a clear sense of what you're trying to do. <laughs> um, I say over and over and over again from the beginning to the end that I am not a consultant. I'm not trained to be a consultant. I don't feel comfortable in that style of engagement with a place. And if they want a consultant, I'm not the person for them. But what I do often offer is say what I can be is a little bit of a mirror or a lens into your organization. So I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to tell you how to change things and I'm not going to give you strategic insight, but I can tell you like these are the main points of tension or what I'm hearing on the ground, or I can be a little bit of a mirror into kind of the everyday work process. And that's usually more than sufficient. Uh, a lot of times I find actually multiple places I found that management actually cares and is curious about what the culture is. Now that may mean something different to everyone, but if you're able to say like, here's what, here's what I sense is your culture or, you know, the main things that people talk about, the main way they relate to each other, again, not breaking the confidentiality, that that can be surface enough to us that it wouldn't be, you don't feel like you're kind of, um, you know, exposing yourself of what your research question is, but it's really actually valuable and interesting to them. I have several times given presentations at the end that, but that, that kind of live on that level. And so I'm going back for more data or clean break, that completely depends on the relationships and kind of what you set up when you leave. I have done both. Um, and actually the place I made a clean break from, I wish I hadn't because I wanted to go back for more data and it really didn't work out. So generally I like to leave it open um, and if, if it's possible, though I also had one company that was like taken over by someone else. So, but you know, I actually went back to individuals and I went back to individuals after they dispersed and found other jobs and that was interesting too. But in terms of going back to the company, that was never gonna happen. One of the tricky, trickiest parts about kind of taking ethnographic data and turning it into something that's legible to an academic community is the whole process of analyzing and writing, obviously. In terms of the practice of analyzing my data, I have done several different things. I always, I have used in vivo. I have coded every line. <laughs> Um, I don't analyze until after I leave generally, or sometimes in that middle break, but I would never code every line ever in the middle. If anything, I'll just transcribe a few interviews or read through some transcriptions if I've been able to get them done outside and just try and kind of think through what's, what's interesting here. My sense is over, over the years, and everybody's different here, is that coding every line is very good for answering, for, for, for certain kinds of insight. To me, it has not been good for the major ahas. Everything I've ever studied, I knew what was interesting going out of the field. I knew it was interesting in the field. And it was just a long, long process of articulating that and making it, again, legible to an academic audience. Coding never changed my gut feeling of what was interesting. Now, if my gut feeling of what is interesting is the conversational dynamics between superiors and subordinates, then I better darn well code those interactions, right? And Or if my gut feeling is that what's interesting is, you know, kind of episodes of shaming or something like that like if, it, if it's a micro thing that you really think like this is this is what's going on that I want to explore you have to code that with a lot of nuance so to me the coding has generally come been well I've done it wrong for me 
and I coded first. I found that not helpful. To me, code, the, the micro coding has generally been most useful much further along in the process when I know what I'm looking for. So right now I'm coding data and I'm back to actually coding microly you know, with, with some specificity the field notes of a bunch of families that we've been in the family. And, you know, it's been a year since we left the families, and we've been doing a ton of brainstorming and memoing and note-taking and trying to think about what's interesting there. And now we are inter we've figured out what we're interested in, which is, to us, it's the way these kind of cultural discourses about certain kinds of workers figure down into the everyday practices of living. So now I know what I'm looking for, and what I'm looking for is an the example of a theoretical argument. So that, to, so to me, generating the theoretical argument from the coding has been very difficult. But that once I have a general sense of what I think the theoretical lens is going to be, then I go code for it. And it, of course, that could be proven wrong. But that's what's been helpful for me. Um, now, where do those theoretical ahas come from? I couldn't tell you. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, that's where I, I do like to read things. Kind of, I will sit down and read a bunch of interviews at once just to get a gestalt feeling and try really hard not to code, I will go out to coffee with a friend and tell them what, what I'm up to. Um, usually it's another friend who's an academic and they can tell me what they're up to. But just the process of talking it through and having someone say, well, what's interesting? Well, what's going on? Well, why do you think that is? Or what about, you know, that can be really helpful in terms of forcing you to, to, gen to you know, articulate and then be generative in your thinking. Often, ahas come from utter frustration. I have a paper called uh, The Autonomy Paradox. I don't know if any of you have read it. And it, it, it's this idea that these kind of high, um, very prestigious information knowledge professionals, lawyers, venture capitalists, investment bankers, that they were uh, embraced this new technology of the kind of smartphone BlackBerry. And they loved it. And they did it in such a way that that they felt a lot of personal attachment to this device. And in so doing, we're not really seeing the kind of um, the ways in which that device was undermining their position and their autonomy and actually what the occupation stood for in some way. And I walked away from my 60th interview with these people. And I was, I mean, I literally was almost crying because I thought, I really thought I would go into the field and find out that people felt some sort of, ambivalence about their BlackBerry, anything, that they thought it was an electronic leash or that it was, oh, you know, and I heard 60 darn people, like literally 60 people in a row tell me how much they loved this stupid thing. And I, I thought I had nothing. I thought I have nothing interesting here. I, I cannot write a paper that says everybody loves their BlackBerry, you know, like that just, it was so frustrating and it took me many years, to, but, but that itself was the insight, you know. That it's impossible. Okay, really? Why are sixty people telling me they love their BlackBerry? And what does that mean? And what is the how is what how is that love being expressed? And what is it masking? That that became the theoretical lens that you know over time became a really interesting argument. But so it was literally just my complete frustration. So yeah, I don't know where the ahas always come from. They just come from a lot of mulling over and less to me line by line coding. And I've seen a lot of people do the line by line coding, and then you just, it's really easy to get lost in the forest or the trees. Okay, so how did you figure out what parts of your findings to report and how to write about certain things abstractly? So I want to give you, I guess there's three or four things. One is you have to be very willing to literally throw away 90% of your data. Literally, you're never going to use it. You're never going to write about it. It doesn't matter, ever. <laughs> and that's really, really hard after you spent a year in the field and oh God, how many hours writing field notes. Like, there is some point where you have to be okay that you don't know what the nugget is or what's going to support your argument. You have no idea. And it's going to be something that you may not even notice. You know, I mentored a student, and she was working, on, working with these two different project teams who were working on a spacecraft. And she realized at some point that both teams had mugs that were made. <laughs> and one of the mugs was like planes. It was like planes, physic planes. That was the image of the craft. And the other mug was an actual picture of the craft. 
And she'd written that down in her field notes, didn't think much about it at the time. Well, that became the data that actually told her story for her about the different ways that these teams were orienting to this craft as a very different kind of object that worked in different ways and that then filtered into how they organized around the craft. And it was this lovely, lovely ethnographic detail of the fact that they actually had these very different images put on their coffee mugs. It took her maybe two years to realize that that was the key piece of data. And you don't know what that data is when you're in it. And then, you know, so your, your coffee mug, you don't know what it is. And you're just not going to know what it is for a really, really long time. So that's why you have to collect everything that you can, you know, given limitations, and just have faith, true faith, that your coffee mug will kind of rise to the surface. Um, the nice thing about the coffee mug example also is that oftentimes you're told as an ethnographer or a student um, who's trying to do this kind of work is that you need more detail. That what we have that other types of methods don't is empirical detail um, and description. And what I took me a while as a student to realize is that does not mean that they want a description of my field site. Like, I'm not going to say I walked in and the, you know, the door was four feet by two feet and it was made out of this certain kind of material and you know like the carpeting was this and like yes I was there and I have this kind of rich description of a lot of their work practices and work site that doesn't matter unless it tells the sto theoretical story right so her coffee mugs are part of description of the field site but what makes them so compelling is that they're helping tell a theoretical story and that's when people say you need more empirical detail it's empirical detail in service of a theoretical story not just for the sake of like how many different pictures they had on the wall or something um so so you need to collect that detail in your field notes you need to write down what the carpet's made of and how many pictures are on the wall and take pictures of their offices whatever it is because you just don't know what that detail is going to be but you're not going to ever write it up as a long boring you know descriptive story it has it doesn't get easier over the years to do this but what gets easier is i now have faith that it will happen so i am much more comfortable in the kind of rigorous messiness that is analyzing and making sense of ethnographic data. Now it is rigorous. We're not pulling stuff out of our ass. You know, we just aren't. But there is the art, the artfulness of trying to figure out what's interesting here and then how do I frame that story in terms of either the theoretical concepts that are out there in my field or ones that I'm going to kind of bring to the table that add on to other conversations. I have a lot more faith that I'm going to figure it out and that it's going to be a long process and I'm going to mull it over and whatever. The biggest problem with learning to do this kind of work, in my mind, is just the deep anxiety that I don't have enough data, or I don't know what it's going to be about, or I don't have a story. And people who aren't able to go with that anxiety and manage it and go towards it and have faith that they're going to get through it, they're not the kind of people that should be doing ethnographic work. Would I have changed any of the steps? I don't think it's possible to say I would have changed my steps of theorizing because those seem a little bit haphazard and random. But I will tell you that every single time I've ever been in the field or probably will ever be in the field, I kick myself about 20 times a day about what I could have done differently. That's both in terms of, oops, I realized that my question in this interview was leading and I kind of hinted at the fact that I understood that there were deep power dynamics going on here and I wish I hadn't. Um, just just last week, I was in an interview with these top, top people in the, the court system. We're studying this change effort. And I said, so, you know, I know that um, this certain date, that up until this date, the policy in the courts was no one's making any mistakes and we're just going to take it all as a learning experience. But now what's your impression of what's going to happen after this date? Okay, this was like common knowledge among the people I've been studying. This date had been trumpeted out over and over and over again among the rank and file and the immediate managers. But the bosses didn't know about the date. So this one lady is like, oh, what is this? I mean, I could have shrunk in my seat. It's like the last thing, the last thing I want to do is, I mean, I mean, I just couldn't believe it. But in some way, how would I have ever known? You know, to me, this was not a sensitive topic, um, and I didn't know that the, basically that 
the higher ups didn't know about the state. So that's the kind of thing that like you just you just going to kick yourself for and you can't always stop it. Also, you know, I could have asked this, I should have asked that, I should have been longer, I should have talked to that person. Um, it used to rack me with guilt and frustration, and, and it still, still does to a little bit, but not the same degree, because I just have, have had to get over that. And then in terms of the review process, I'm going to tell you that I have been incredibly lucky, or all the stories about that out there about qualitative work and reviewers are bunk. <laughs> so I have had, uh, at this point, I have had four quali purely qualitative journal articles published in A venues, and I have three more that are under review. So I have that number of reviews. Um, and... I've never had a review, well, so I've had some reviewers that have maybe been a little unfair, but I've never had a set of reviews that don't seem to get the kind of nature of qualitative work and ethnographic work, and that for that occasional, very occasional reviewer that seems to be on a different page, the kind of, the AE has been like, forget that person. Um, now, that's not to say the reviews aren't harsh. They're incredibly harsh. I think we're incredibly, we're a harsh community that holds each other up to some pretty high standards of what is good work and what is good analysis and what is kind of empirical evidence and proof. But that's okay. Like, that doesn't bother me at all. Um, but the bottom line is that they're fair and generative. And, I mean, 90% of the time I get these great examples or great suggestions about where to go and what to do next. The tricky part can be kind of weeding through the different suggestions from different reviewers and figuring out what's the story that I want to tell. And how do I take all of these, all of this feedback and honor it and then yet figure out my way? Because there's absolutely no way ever that you're going to be able to do all the things that all the reviewers say. You would write a horrible paper, right? Because they're all seeing in your paper the paper that they could would like to write or they could see coming out of this. But they're all different. So you never are going to satisfy everyone. So, so you have to figure out what is the good. And most reviewers are like, you know, this, I see a weakness here. Now, for me, I go this direction. Um, but, but most reviewers don't really care if you go that direction as long as you've addressed that weakness. So the idea that you read a review and be like, oh, no, we have to go that direction, I can find completely false. I found that I say, you know what, you're right. This was a weakness, and this is one great path, but, you know, I decided to go this way for this reason. They're like, oh, good for you. You know, like they're just trying to help you. They're not trying to say you have to, to follow my ideas. Um, but they are good at exposing the weaknesses. Um, and for me, 99.999% of the time, it's not about methods. So the weaknesses are about framing. They're about finding your theoretical hook. They're about articulating a theoretical hook, about, you know, articulating a research question that's really compelling and answering it. Um, they're about, you know, Really, the, the, whole, the whole art of framing the beginning and end of your paper, that's where I've tended to get the most critique. And I think that's actually common in qualitative work because our data is so rich. The Really, the tricky part, as you probably know, is that abstraction and kind of crafting an argument that fits in with current theoretical conversations. Um, if anything, sometimes the math, I have gotten a little bit, well, I've gotten both. I've gotten some of you say, you know, don't tell me all of your analysis. It's too much. I don't need to know all of that. So I've, I've been able to cut down my method sections quite a lot in several papers. I just got a paper back that was like, you know, give us a little more. <laughs> like, how did you get to that? And you know, how did you deal with this? And they were all fair questions, but I think I had, like, swung to paring it down too much. But those are all fair and easy. Um, I will say I just had a paper published in AMJ, um, which was a really unique for me. It was with a postdoc who had done a true ethnography. She was a student of Martha Feldman's. Her name's... Katie Pine. So this new paper we got published, um, we had these long vignettes of kind of nursing practice, like by minute by minute time step that were really integral for the story we we're trying to tell, which was the kind of inefficiencies and kind of contorted practice that was being brought into being with this new electronic health record system. So we have in the paper a whole half a page of like a giant vignette that's like at 3.30 she does this. At 4, I mean, we tell it like a story. But it's, I mean, it's a bunch of italicized writing. And then we contextualize it and talk about it and go back to it and weave in other insights from the field and our kind of analysis of that story. And I thought it was a real risk when we sent this in. You know, there was no coding. There was no first level, second level, third level codes, none of it. Um, and, you know, 
the paper went through two rounds of revise and resubmit and never once did anyone complain about the data. It was all about just getting our story right and honing it in and whatever else. It, I guess it gave me faith about the kind of the openness of the qualitative community and management scholarship that isn't often the story we tell about ourselves. So when students get really, really panicked that if I don't have the 18 codes and all of this, that they're ne I'm never going to publish in a top venue. And I just personally haven't found that to be the case. As long as the data is good and the theorizing is good. What is the main piece of advice for new ethnographers? I think it would be to follow your gut and your passion, because if you're not interested in your work, no one else will be. That our, you know, our role as, as, as scholars is to get the world, whether it even be just your colleagues or your tenure letter writers or your job talk people, get them excited about what you're doing, that it's important and interesting and worth doing. And if you don't feel that, you're going to be far less effective <laughs> in projecting that to others. Um, so that would be one. I think that you have to be humans in the field because this is a really human endeavor and you can't pretend it's not. And if you actually want people to trust you, you have to give them something to trust. And we often hide behind our role as scholars or experts or whatever it is because it's really uncomfortable to be in the field. And that's not going to serve you in the long run or in the short run. Um, and then lastly, I think it's just literally to have faith and you're going to have enough data and you're going to figure it out. And that that, that faith actually has to like carry you through years of uncertainty. <laughs>